You may have seen this chart since the start of the coronavirus pandemic. In one image, it appears to capture the state of each nation's battle in the global war against the virus. But like all data visualizations, its design tends to emphasize some things and hides others. So here are four things we need to know to understand this chart. First, this is not a chart of all coronavirus cases. It's only showing us confirmed cases. That means each line doesn't just reflect the state of the outbreak in a country, but also how aggressively that country is testing people for the virus. Take a look at Japan and South Korea earlier in the pandemic. Japan's outbreak looked pretty small in comparison. But the available data on testing shows us that South Korea had tested vastly more people than Japan did, even though their population is less than half as big. And now, as Japan slowly increases their testing, the outbreak there looks more worrying. It's a good reminder that we can't understand case data without some sense of the testing levels, and that's especially true for lower-income countries where we know their testing capacity is limited. The second thing to know is that the scale for the y-axis on this chart is a bit different from most charts. It's called a logarithmic or log scale. On a typical linear scale, you divide the space by adding the same value over and over. The log scale is made by multiplying a value, in this case, 10. 100 times 10 is 1,000, times 10 is 10,000, times 10 is 100,000. That means that there's no fixed amount of space on this chart for a certain number of cases. So the first 100,000 cases take up this much space, and then the next 100,000 cases get just this much. The higher the numbers, the more visibly squished they become on a log scale. So why do it this way? Well, let's take the five countries with the largest outbreaks right now and rewind them back to March 17th. On a linear scale, it looked like things were pretty bad in Italy, but the others were doing better. The log scale offered a much clearer warning. We were all on the same path of exponential growth. It's the nature of infectious disease that numbers get big fast. So it makes sense for numbers to get big fast on the chart too. Fast forward a few weeks and the linear scale shows cases climbing and climbing, while the log chart shows curves that are flattening. As governments have implemented lockdowns and social distancing, the virus is spreading at a slower rate than before, which isn't very visible on the linear scale. But keep in mind that the difference between this dot and this dot is more than 32,000 people. And the log chart tends to downplay just how many more confirmed cases there are in the US than in the other countries. Which brings us to the third thing to know about our chart. It doesn't account for population size. When you adjust for population, really small countries like Iceland and Luxembourg appear to have the biggest outbreaks for their size, which may reflect higher testing rates. The US and China have much bigger populations, so their curves drop a bit. But the size of a country doesn't really affect the growth rate of its cases, and it doesn't tell us much about how much the country is struggling. It just pushes smaller countries up on the chart and tends to hide the fact that the outbreak is especially bad in certain regions of bigger countries, like the state of New York. And the last thing to know about our chart is that the x-axis doesn't plot time by the date, but by the number of days since the country recorded 100 confirmed cases. For Italy, that was February 24th. For Turkey, March 19th. When they're all layered on top of each other, it allows us to compare the trajectory of the outbreaks. But it tends to obscure the fact that the pandemic hit some countries before it hit others. The world watched as tens of thousands of cases appeared in China. Then big outbreaks in South Korea, Italy, and Iran sent a message about what was to come. Two weeks after South Korea reported its 100th case, the United States did the same. In a situation where actions taken early can have a much bigger impact than actions taken later, time is a crucial factor. And we have to remember that some governments had more time than others. This is Ada Verna's continuing coverage on the coronavirus crisis. 
A very good evening and welcome to our special coverage on the coronavirus crisis right here on Get Real. We're continuing, we are trying to get an understanding exactly what our new life is going to be. Last week we've been talking about the legal problems that might arise in, in this new uh, society, in this new world that we are facing right now because of COVID-19. Um, recently we've seen a little bit of a spike um, in numbers here in Sri Lanka. So there is a little bit of fear uh, as to what's going on. Are we, are we uh, keeping this under control or what's going what's happening so i thought of let's invite the people responsible and get uh, the information right from their mouths and um, get an understanding of what's happening uh, i've invited uh, dr Papa palihavanna from the epidemiology unit uh, here at the ministry of health and also uh, admiral professor janal kolumbage who is uh, a member of the uh, presidential task force which is handling the covid 19 operations in short uh, Dr. Papa is in charge of uh, the virus and <laughs> Admiral is in charge of the operation. So um, uh, let me start with you, Doctor. Um, the question, like uh, recent days, we've seen uh, double digits mm -hmm. in, in numbers. Mm -hmm. There's a spike. This is uh, attributing to uh, finding a, a cluster within the Navy. So what's going on? Is, is Are we still under control or are we losing the plot? Yes. So Good question. Yes, because as we all see, you know, double numbers and where well, the numbers are doubling within a very short period yeah. of time. So, you know, we reach 600. In fact, very, yeah, in fact, so, you know, by we, we were having around some 360 odd, but then within about a you know, week, with, within a few days, of course, it has doubled. Like. So, yeah, that is the reason why everybody has got excited and asking whether whether we have gone beyond the clusters and whether there is any community transmission, so whether it is happening in our country because the numbers are rising. But what we need to understand is why these numbers have rise that we need to look into details of it. And uh, you know that sort of we have identified a big cluster very recently. So that would have been one reason why yeah, within the Navy camp, that would have been one reason why we have got a kind of, you know, sudden increase in numbers. And also we have had the Bandaranaika Mawat, yes. another community cluster. Of course, it was a kind of, again, it's a quite a big cluster. So where we have examined around more than 1,500 sampling and now it's found to be negative but anyway that also had been a big cluster where it has added more numbers to the total so the similarly this has been even you know bigger and where we had around 260 odd positives yes. and then of course out of our some 620 odd so it's of course one fourth would be uh, would have uh, has been uh, you know because of this particular incident what has happened in the uh, Navy camp. So, but uh, so that is why we have got these large numbers that we need to understand, and it is not really where we had a kind of a community spread and where we are getting the numbers. It's increase. just one single cluster. Uh, so, the question, uh, Doctor, is is this under control? Have we, have we like, you know, that is what everybody wants to know. Is the health ministry, health epidemiology unit, everybody who's in charge of it, is this under control? Yes. So now, of course, you would see. So it is, of course, under control. And we know where these people have gone. And also we have identified them in the community and also the close contacts and also the neighborhood. Now we have started taking samples from those people. And also not only that, so we have got this group into a place where we have already contained and there we have the access to go and examine them and go and test them so therefore we don't have a kind of you know within the clusters in the community any transmission bit going between uh, people going among the cluster members so therefore it is well under control with the support of everybody of course now uh, Sri Lanka army sort of they have they and the navy and the tri forces they have brought them to a kind of you know centers you call it to contain Mm. centers mm. and we are now they are residing and so now we are going and examining them and testing them to see and also treating them those who have been positive we are now they have been hospitalized so they are therefore now it is well under control so now we we know that we are they are 
Indeed, uh, Admiral, you are uh, uh, you are our former Navy commander. Uh, this this particular spread is very close to your heart. Yes, sir. Um, yes. And and these Navy sailors did not just you know get it out from out from the blues. They were actually right. in active duty, and that is why they got uh, contracted by this particular uh, virus. Now, um, the question from the operational side. Has steps been taken by the government uh, to ensure the safety of these sailors, their health? Uh, more, um, I mean, I, we understand from doctors, you know, everything has been done that it, it is not spreading to the communities. But let's talk about the sailors mm -hmm. uh, and their health. What kind of action the government has taken on that? Well, I think government has been very concerned about the safety of all frontline Indeed. personnel. Now, in this case, I see the military and the public health inspectors, I mean, our MOH, uh, even the doctors who actually initially diagnose uh, and treat B, uh, patients, they are the frontline. So, unfortunately, they are also getting exposed and thereby they become vulnerable to contracting the disease as well. So, in the case of the Navy, it is like, as you said, you know, they went to a particular place where there was not a very ruly crowd. They were very unruly. You can't just say, okay, please come into the bus, let's go, not like that. They were climbing trees, they were trying to jump over a fence, they were trying to have a bath, they were trying to uh, jump into a canal, that kind of a people. So they had from, to be- From which area was this? Uh, this is the, uh, the, 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 the Jayala. Suduella. Suduella area, right? So unfortunately, the people had to physically control they, them yeah. and take them into the bus. Right? So I, we believe that is a possible moment where some of our frontline sailors were exposed to the virus. Now, unfortunately, you know, the, the scale of these operations were quite large. Right? So we were not 100% prepared for that kind of an eventuality. But you see, now we have also learned. Now, any platoon going out for such operation, there will be a section. When we say a section, it's about eight people they will be fully covered in personal protective equip, uh, equipment, including coverall, mm -hmm. right? Visors, face masks. Now, in that operation, it was only the face mask they were wearing. So, but now we have learned a lesson that happened, right? Now, of course, you see, uh, I think in this virus, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, madam, there are super spreaders, right? There are slow spreaders and super spreaders. So unfortunately, in this case, the, the particular strain of virus which the Navy got, I think that whoever got it is a super spreader because he has uh, spread it to the Navy because we know the military living is quite confined in uh, messes, we call it. Uh, that's the normal military day-to-day -day life and you are sharing things. Maybe the mess you eat, you share. The bathrooms you share. Everybody cannot be given an uh, individual bathroom. Practically, it's not possible. It has never happened, right? But in this case, so it's basically a community living. Now, they were exposed therein. And of course, you see, you can't keep the sailors in a camp for a too long, right? They, are, they also have families. They yeah. need to go home. Uh, so then some of the sailors were permitted to go home. And also, I think uh, they spread it to their peers or the people who are near good. them. And then it became little, uh, very high uh, cluster. So what the government did immediately is that bring them all because there were not only the Navy, there were a few uh, Air Force and Army personnel also got infected, brought them all back to the camp. Now, when they came back to the camp, you know, there is no room, enough room for all the people to be in the camp. So they have taken some hotels in some places, uh, some schools in some places. Now these people are there under observation. Right. Uh, they're not positive yet. They're not positive. I mean, quite a, it's only a very minor percentage of that crowd is positive, actually. But now the health authorities, the public health inspectors, the med medical officers of health, together with the Navy and, the, of course, Army and the Air Force, they are monitoring the situation of these personnel who had been brought back after the, 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 the military was recalled to barracks, we call it, called yeah. to barracks. So they were brought back. Now they are being uh, monitored. And of course, they are being housed in uh, separate uh, containment areas. And I think we have to wait and see the situation. But I think the good news is 
again as Dr. Pabase, this is an identified cluster. It's not a. It's not something which came out of it's the blue. It's not community spreading. No, it is not it's community not spreading at all. It's a very small community. When you compare the total population of Sri Lanka, if, if we say 21 million, this is only 260. So it's a very small population. But the, I think the good point is we have identified that population and now we are taking care of that population. And also another thing uh, I must mention then in this virus there are people who show signs mm. and some people who do not show anything. Yeah. Now in the case of the Navy, in, in fact, they were not showing any signs. They were not having a cough, a cold, a fever, no fever. or nothing. Right, so they were basically yeah, asymptomatic, young and healthy, so young and healthy <laughs> asymptomatic, and they go by the daily uh, business of doing. So we got to remember the the sailors got this by trying to protect the population from this virus. It's not something they just got it. So we need to respect that. Yeah, yeah indeed, yeah, um, indeed. That, that that is something uh, we really need to keep in mind when we are talking about uh, these numbers about the navy uh, and even the healthcare workers i know there is a lot of issues with regard to nurses uh, when they actually you know engage in supporting patients and when they go mm -hmm. home they've been treated in a mm -hmm. very unruly and uh, unfair manner mm -hmm. which is not not suitable and it should not happen in a country like sri lanka where we actually keep mm -hmm. our, our you know we respect uh, so much the religion uh, teaches us doctor uh, before we go into a commercial break uh, quickly, I want to know now, around 200 uh, um, uh, num number of pe people have been found in that Navy. Uh, what is their status? Are they like, uh, you know, the, the, the methodology that everybody thinks is as soon as you are positive for COVID-19, you're dead. <laughs> that's that's the ideology that everybody is thinking. Oh my God! You know you're dead. But that's not the case, right? No. That what is the status, the health status of those? Yes, so that's they're it. quite all right. So they've been treated at Valisara Hospital. There's a Valisara base. You have a hospital, Navy hospital, and also some of them are in the uh, IDH hospital. Mm -hmm. So likewise, sir, we have few. Uh, uh, patients, patients in the sense those who have become positive. Of course, most of them were symptomless, and uh, they were quite all right. So none, nobody is having any complications so far. So and nobody is uh, in the uh, in the ICU. ICU. No, no. Uh, at this moment. Yeah. And if I may add, I mean, from the beginning till now. In Sri Lanka, there had been only seven deaths. Yes. And the last death was, that's I good. think, 7th of April, yes. right, nearly a month ago. I think that speaks volume of success. You know, people monitor the success differently. Yes. But I think here, the value of human life is paramount. Indeed. And we can take pride in that. We have kept that figure to minimum. And I was I also... Having the mortality at Mortality that rate level. at a very low level. Yeah. And uh, I... And also, very briefly, I think uh, right now nobody in the ICU. Nobody right so now. That, 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 that's, yes. I think, amazing. That that actually attributes to the hard work of our health workers, yes, and we course. really need to give the respect to them for that. And one more thing, I really need to remind our viewers is the fact that we are, as, as a country, we are at 3.A. That is the stage the country is in. We are not. We don't. We are not seeing any community uh, spreading of the virus. So, uh, New Zealand, about two, three mm -hmm. days back, uh, they were at the community spreading level. So they went under lockdown, they had like three, four weeks of lockdown curfew and everything. And uh, about two days back, the Prime Minister, Jacinta Ardern, uh, when they came back to 3.B, mm -hmm. they claimed saying that they beaten COVID-19 in New Zealand. So we have to be really proud about our health workers and trust them. Not social media, not Facebook, mm -hmm. not, not, not what you read here and there. Just trust the official uh, uh, information that has been passed by the health ministry, the officials. Uh, let's take a short commercial break. There are, there's a lot more to discuss as soon as we come back. Uh, you're watching Get Real. I'm in conversation with Dr. Pabal Palihuan and also Anwar Professor Jana of Colombia. We'll be right back. This is Ada Verana's continuing coverage on the coronavirus crisis. This is Ada Verana's continuing coverage on the coronavirus crisis. Welcome back everyone to Get Real, our special coverage on the coronavirus crisis. Uh, tonight I'm in conversation with Dr. Papa Palihavadna, Chief Epidemiologist uh, at the Ministry of Health and also Admiral Professor Jainath Kolomogye is a member of the task force that has been established to tackle the COVID-19 uh, here in Sri Lanka. 
Um, I want to start with you, um, Admiral. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, I mean, yes, we are taking care of our people here in Sri Lanka. And one thing that the government has been actively doing since uh, Wuhan is the fact that, you know, bringing back Sri Lankans who are stranded all over the world. Now, I think a lot of um, flights came into uh, the country. Sri Lankan Airlines actually flew in. Well, and uh, we were told that the first, uh, uh, the phase of it is done. Um, mm. If you can just give us an idea about what is this first phase and from where are you, uh, how exactly is the process done? Yeah, I think uh, Sri Lankans have to come back to Sri Lanka. I, that's no question about it. But then also it uh, points out to the fact that everybody feels Sri Lanka is safe. Yeah. You know, otherwise they wouldn't want to come back to Sri Lanka. You know, most of the people either studying or working or gone for short-term visit uh, to other countries. Now they feel Sri Lanka is the safest place for them. So that is why they really want to come. And I, as you mentioned, from the beginning, actually we started this whole operation from evacuating you were, 34, yeah, you were 34 uh, students yeah. from Wuhan. I mean, I always call the phase one of the whole <laughs> operation because it was a success, total yeah. success story. And also, again, very proactive measures taken by our health and the military. So a very successful conclusion of that phase. And then, of course, now we have gone to, uh, I mean, little beyond that. But now, again, the issue came. So many Sri Lankans want to come back. Now, our foreign ministry did a very good thing because they created a web portal mm. and invited all the Sri Lankans living all over the world, please register, please indicate your preference, give us your detail. Now, therefore, we have a pretty good idea about Sri Lankans living abroad, those who actually are interested in coming back to Sri Lanka. So when you look at that, the data, right now I think we have about... Uh, These are not only students, but... No, no, now various... I'm talking about the whole population, uh, the people who want to come back, whoever has registered in the, uh, the web portal. This is not only the students. So when you look at that, there are about 26,000 people from America to Australia wants to come back. Now, when you look at the whole thing, you know, you cannot accept them at one go. Yeah. You cannot just say, okay, our doors are open, please come back. No, it is not good for them. It is not good for us. We have to do it step by step, group by group in a sustainable manner. Because this bringing in student mainly depend on, I mean, number of factors, but two main factors are there. Number one, availability of quarantine centers, number one. Number two, or whatever you like it, ability to carry out PCR testing. Mm -hmm. Now, you see, when beginning, we were doing like 10 PCR tests per day, but now we oh. have gone to 1,500 plus PCR tests per day. But still, when you bring in large yes. number of students, it's not practically possible to test them. And we do have to test them the moment they come here. Why? We don't know where they were. Whether they are, that region, the locality, whether it is safe or not, we don't know. So we want to ensure when they are here that in as early as possible to test them. So that at least if we detect someone, we can prevent the virus spreading to the others. So that is that has been our basic policy. Now, in that sense, the president is very, very carefully studying, analyzing the data, analyzing the data of developing situation in various countries. And very rightly, president came to a decision that first wave will be students. Because everybody say, Students are the most vulnerable group because some of them may be really, you know, there are some 18, 19, up to 20, 30 even. I mean, some of them, the university is closed. Now, sometimes the hostel is also closed, right? So they don't have, and they don't have lots of money because they are students, right? And some places they were doing odd jobs, but now you can't do that also. Now, therefore, considering various aspects, the president decided, okay, we will bring the students first. Now, in that, we are very happy to announce the first phase of that was completed today. Now we have brought in 1,100 students from South countries, South Asian countries, Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, and India. That was a mammoth task. The foreign ministry rose to the occasion. They collected the data, prepared the list. Sri Lankan rose to the occasion. They brought these people. The medical people were ready to receive them and then they were sent to the quarantine centers and now Dr. Pabai and the team are conducting PCR tests. Quite a lot has already been done 
and few more to be done. So that is the first phase. We have done it very successfully. Now we need to go a little beyond because it is like an expanding sphere or expanding circle. Okay. Now we have done the SAC, that is the immediate neighborhood. And our next target is actually to go towards ASEAN. You know, we have uh, Malaysia, Singapore, Singapore yeah. that area. There is a lot and, of uh, Sri Lankan and, population. Yeah. And there. then also go towards the, the west a little, towards Middle East maybe. Now, while we are doing it, we got lucky because there are three flights going, uh, being operated by Sri Lankan carrying cargo, yeah. right? Now, they offered, they said, okay, we have a flight coming back empty. And if you like, you can have some uh, students. So then we jumped to the idea and the president uh, valued everything and he said, okay, let's bring some students back in these flights. So we are going to operate two flights to UK, London and one flight to Admiral, uh, yeah. my, uh, the key question there is now United Kingdom, uh, certain parts of Europe, they are not out from this entire uh, COVID, uh, you know, uh, entire virus, uh, the spreading of it. The, the numbers that they are putting out uh, is very high. Uh, isn't it risky to get people from there right now? Yeah, but I do, do agree with you because they are quite high risk areas, especially England. But then can we neglect our citizens? Can we neglect our students and say, it is dangerous in your country, so don't come, <laughs> right? That's not uh, something we can do as fathers and I mean, president is a father himself. We cannot do that. We have to take that risk. So that is why, we bring calculated them, risk. Calculated risk. We bring them. Actually, when we bring them also, we do it in a very systematic way, right? We identify a group of 15 to 20 students who are actually living in a smaller area, maybe a dormitory, maybe a hostel, maybe a university. Now, that group, from the point of origin until they complete the quarantine here, that is the aircraft movement at airport and airport to quarantine center, that group remains within the group, right? So at least if there are any positive cases, we can contain within that small cluster rather than allowing it to go to the entire 290 possible passengers in an aircraft. So we do it that way in a very scientific manner. Uh, Admiral, what are the countries that you all are going to focus uh, in, in the uh, next? Uh, no, immediately we have just finished the SAC. Now it will be uh, ASEAN countries like uh, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Myanmar, Philippines, that country. And then at the same time, now we got lucky with two flights coming from UK and one flight coming from uh, America and then of course we have a large cluster of students in Russia no. Russia Georgia Belarus Latvia large number so we yes, have to yes. now uh, uh, focus in that area so maybe uh, there are students in Japan there are students in America Canada or I mean New Zealand all have to come only thing we don't want to take any risk with them coming to us. We don't want to expose them to a risk in Sri Lanka. We don't want to expose Sri Lankans to a risk by them. So we have to do it in a very controlled manner. Doctor, so let's talk about that uh, calculated risk uh, that the government and, and you, even your unit is trying to take. Now, if once they come here, uh, you carry out tests and you put them into quarantine, what is your process? Uh, like, how do you trace them? Not only not only these students, but, you know, whenever you find in clusters, how wh how is the epidemiology unit tracing the first contact, second contact? Because at the end of the day, I, I'm sure you're not just going and asking them and believing what they're saying. Uh, you need uh, proof. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what is the methodology? Yeah. So, yeah, as uh, Admiral described, like the students who are coming from other countries, so there is a system that we are, we send them for the quarantine centers and we do the testing. I mean, that is quite straightforward. So, you know, we know that they are from this particular country and this particular area and everything we know about them. So, and you asked about the community. Yes. How we are going to do the kind of, you know, identify tracing. these yeah, contacts and the contact tracing. So then uh, the thing is this, now once you find a positive case in the hospital, probably we, they will be coming to the hospital or we may have identified them in a kind of a quarantine center. Again, it is very straightforward. The positive, he becomes positive, he'll be sent to the hospital. And then he may not be having many contacts in the in, within the center. So, but now, so you know, suppose you see someone in the community. We'll take the example, the Navy personnel. So then we know that of, he, he, there will be his uh, immediate family members. So they are at risk. 
contacts, right? So there is no question about it. They are very, they are the close contacts and immediate family members. So then we need to identify them and we test them. There's no question about it. We do that and by our uh, public health staff in the field. So they go to their premises or the houses and they take swabs and then send to the laboratory and the testing will be done. So, but then not only that, so there will be other close contacts also. He may have visited several, you know, uh, relatives, the friends, they may he may have, he or she may have had contacts with them, maybe some other close contacts. So then those people also will be identified. So the thing is, uh, you said that they may not give the correct yeah. facts. But the thing, like, so the thing is this, now, so you can ask the question from the infected person the, uh, who is in the hospital. And then again, you can ask the family members. And sometimes sort of, he may be easily, you know, there, there is a way to ask questions also. And when you identify the third person or the fourth person, you can cross check. So when you ask from him, so what are the contact that you had with the patient, the first positive one. So then likewise, so sort of, you can, you know, explore and you can extract the information from all these contacts, like by searching everybody. There have been instances where we even saw with the Navy uh, mm -hmm. personnel where he has visited a mobile store, he mm -hmm. has gone to this area, mm -hmm. that area. Now, uh, I mean, the, the person, like if, say, if, say uh, I went to that particular mobile store and I would not know that there was a, a positive mm -hmm. person before me or after me or whatever. Uh, so how do uh, you all trace and see? Yeah, uh, so you know? that, yeah, that is the thing. So now, like, uh, the thing is this. Now, suppose if he mentioned about a place where he has visited, so then we go to that place and then we start questioning and also there may be some you know CCTV. like what you call this yeah cctvs and those things also we have monitored so likewise then the phones mobile phones also through those uh, telephone lines also we can trace these people okay well this person has visited where well, exactly he has gone so suppose if he has lied that also will come out when you mm. sort of try to match with the other information so it is not only from the health ministry data we also cross check with the uh, intelligence. intelligence information also mm -hmm. so then we know like you know that is how we cross check and also we get the information from the community brahman iladari from other sources Teacher. they also yeah public health inspector so likewise sort of, we can collect information even the neighborhood they will start saying okay mm -hmm. this person came from this place yesterday and then he has visited these these places likewise sir, i mean everyone would can't be, you know, they yeah. will not lie, everybody mm -hmm. will not lie like that. So then what you do is you try to gather, you know, the correct information by asking each and every person and also comparing with the, you know, intelligence information. And other. The other thing is how quickly is this happening because this virus is also, oh, Within you know, first 24 hours, mm -hmm. we trace everything. And now, for example, for one particular uh, positive person, there may be 60 70 contacts sometimes and some maybe for some people it may be the numbers may be small but this can happen so like for all the positive cases here in sri lanka right now have you all tracked them we have every each and every case has been tracked not a single person has been left out and we know that is how we have found the connection also where exactly he has gone and how did he get the infection so that is how we go that is why we have been able to control also mm -hmm. then and there. Otherwise, we would have gone to the community and we have, may have missed the cases. Suppose if we may have missed, if we have missed, so then there would be a spread of the disease mm -hmm. in that particular community. Would come out later, maybe in a week or two weeks time, which we have not observed in our country so far. Indeed, uh, I want to talk about, uh, you know, uh, yes, lockdown, curfew and everything is, uh, you know, done in order to safeguard you, but that does not mean that's the uh, last option. The whole idea is to get back to, into normal, see how can we get our country running. So I want to get uh, um, uh, the views of our um, guests today and for that let's take a short commercial break. You're watching Get Real, I'm in conversation with Dr. Pabha Palihwadna and also Admiral Professor Jainath Kulge. We'll be right back. This is Adha Verana's continuing coverage on the coronavirus crisis. This is Adha Verana's continuing coverage on the coronavirus crisis.
Welcome back everyone to Get Real, our continuing coverage on the coronavirus crisis. I'm in conversation with the Chief Epidemiologist uh, at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Pabla Palihuatna, and also um, uh, Professor John of Columbia, member of the Task Force uh, operating to curb COVID-19 here in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, Professor, very quickly, uh, we are running out of time. What I want to know is what's the plan to get back to normalcy by the government side? Um, there are two or three things that is going out right now is the fact that you know because the government wants to um, quickly have the elections uh, get power two-thirds majority all this nonsense um, government is putting the people's lives at risk by opening uh, the country um, the end goal is to reopen sri lanka that's that's what we have to do so what's the plan how are we going to get there well i have not seen a single sign from the government uh, that they want to have a quick election and be in a majority i have not seen it i mean i know the president and the prime minister everyone is so careful about the lives of people yes we all need to have a exit strategy we need we are in a kind of a lockdown curfew so we want to be locked out mm -hmm. right but that has to be done according to a strategy we can't just do it, okay, from everything is open now. No, but we know that what will happen if you open in an unplanned manner. Yeah. So, right? so there is a clear strategy now for an exit. Now, the GMOA has come out with their own strategy. COVID task force is discussing about an exit strategy. The other academic scientists, they put their inputs, right? So all these inputs are taken and the president is having at least once a week a very high level meeting on COVID, including today, uh, uh, there will be a meeting. So that forum, they discuss each and every point, right? So we, we have to listen to the health authority because this is a health emergency, this is a pandemic. Right, this is a medical uh, public health emergency. So they are also advising, and I think good thing that we have controlled the movement or the mobility of people, we have to control. If we did not control the mobility of the people the way we did, this would have definitely spreaded. But we were, I think we were controlling at least 75 to 80% mobility we were controlling. Right, so that actually helped us to contain and control the virus. Now it is that they have a plan, it will be done uh, stage wise, step by step, minimum inconvenience to the people, but giving highest priority to the health of people. That's the priority, prevent this. Now we can't say, I mean, yes, we are very proud that we have not gone to 3B even, but that's not the, our objective, our end goal is, I'm not saying that we want zero cases. Yeah, there may be- That, that cannot things. happen. It cannot happen. Yeah. but. It is well under control of our medical system. Uh, Dr. Baba, uh, let me ask you uh, point blank. Is the government taking your advice? <laughs> yeah. Good question. <laughs> yeah, of course. So they have been generally listening to us since the beginning. So and we have been operating the way, of course, it is epidemiologically correct and factually correct. Uh, measures have been applied in the in the control of this uh, COVID-19 outbreak. So that is why we have been able to come to this level. So there had been a kind of, you know, quite a lot of uh, support from the government. And after listening to our advice, uh, has been implemented throughout the country you, since the you, beginning of the outbreak. How do you see uh, us uh, the, as a nation getting out from this? You know, um, washing hands, wearing face masks, this is going to be uh, the norm of our new life uh, as we go on. So uh, until there's a vaccine, uh, we need to actually take, uh, uh, people have to take responsibility and be responsible uh, citizens. So how do you see this particular virus? What is the, uh, you know, shelf life? You, you think it'll continue for another three, four, five months? What is your take Yeah, on because this? it depends on this kind of, you know, the way that the virus is spreading and also the fact that we have to have the connections with the other countries as well. So as uh, Admiral very clearly, very correctly said, so we cannot be, you know, closed down our country forever. So we may have to open it up. So therefore, the virus will be here, here for some time, naturally. So this is the picture that we have observed in other countries. It was started in China, I think, the last year, right? Last year, And it's still they're having. 
for around for about a six but months. They, they five to six opened. months they have been having. So that's how. Once the case load is so low, so we, we may also have to open the country and we have to start with our activities. And in fact, we need to think of the economy and so the education and so you know the everything we need tourism. So there are a whole lot of things which you know we have to work on and we have to think of. So that is what we are also trying our best to sort of, you know, bring down the caseload. Of course, we may have to continue these health practices mm -hmm. for some time. The distance. I think course, yeah. the, the hand rest washing of your life would be better. <laughs> <laughs> so it is good for, yes, it is good for everybody. Yes. It would prevent all other respiratory <laughs> infections. Indeed. Uh, very quickly, uh, Admiral, uh, the stocks uh, for the PCR test, I want to get uh, your take uh, on that as well. You know, uh, what is the status of the stocks with regard, you know, we are not generating anything here in Sri Lanka. We have to export everything. Uh, currently, we have uh, limited numbers. Uh, so what exactly is the government doing on that? Yeah, actually, as you said, like uh, when we say a PCR test, yeah, the machine is there, the technicians, the lab technicians are there, but there are so many components you need to carry out one test. You need the test kit, mm -hmm. you need the consumables, you need extraction kits, you, you need VTM, all that components. So many, things. so many things have to come in. And unfortunately, of course, we are trying experimenting. We are not producing any of these things. So we need to depend on the external sources to supply. Now, the issue is too, Number one, they also don't want yeah. to give the total quantity to us. There is a global scarcity. There is a global scarcity. They want to keep it for themselves. Yes. So they will issue only a limited quantity. And number two is transport because flights are not working. Yes. But I'm saying so far we have managed it pretty well. And as, or, as we speak, a consignment of uh, extraction kits are on the way from Malaysia to Sri Lanka. Uh, test How kits, many numbers? Uh, I think, uh, I don't know the numbers because these are, when you say numbers, sometimes it is actually, if I say 1,000, it is 6,000 because it yes. multiply, right? Yes. So I can't give you the number. Then another test kit consignment is coming from Germany and con what we call consumable, the small pieces are on the way from Kolkata. So things are coming and I think we are pretty safe uh, to conduct the test that we need. Indeed, uh, that is all the time we have uh, tonight. I uh, really want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Papa Palihavadna and also uh, Admiral Professor Jainath Kulambage for coming back on the show and uh, speaking to us. Uh, BC days uh, being there, 24 hour operations going on. And thank you very much for everything that you've been doing. Uh, well, that's it from uh, Get Real for this week. I'll be back again at around 9.35 with World News. Uh, bye for now. This is Ada Verana's continuing coverage on the coronavirus crisis.